the past five years in the kingdom, there has been a huge shift in youth potential, in expanding uh, horizons, expanding sectors, uh, putting a lot of effort into both human development infrastructure as well as real infrastructure. And so there's a lot of work that has been happening in the past few years. This year, when the whole world seems to be going heading into a recession, we're booming. Saudi Arabia is the place to be right now. Welcome to The Feedback Loop, a Sino-Global Capital podcast where we keep you in the loop about the most pressing issues in Web3 today. I'm your host, Mona Hamdi, a Harvard Teaching Fellow with 20 years of experience in nonprofit and sustainable development. I started using emerging technologies 15 years ago, working with remote peoples to create new economies based on the reversal of climate change. And today, I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Sino, where I hope to bring beneficial technologies to the most forgotten corners of this planet. On today's episode, I'm joined by Saudi serial entrepreneur Mona Abu Suleiman. Mona is no stranger to the startup ecosystem and to the business world of the Arab world and of the global economy. She is an activist, a TV personality, the former founding secretary general of the Al Walid bin Talal Foundation, and is a co-host of the longest running Arab television show on social issues called Kalam Nawam. She's recognized as a global expert in education, sustainable development, female empowerment, and is just really a figurehead, a leader, and I'm grateful to call her a friend. I want to talk to Mona about everything that we're seeing in the kingdom, what we're looking at in terms of MENA and the investment ecosystem that we're hearing so much about in our industry, venture capital, philanthropy, and all things Mona. So let's get right into it. Hey, Mona. First of all, hi, lovely to see you. I know we, uh, we met a long time ago when you were still in Saudi Arabia and doing your amazing development work. And of course, we follow each other on Twitter. And we were supposed to be together at Harvard, and I was not <laughs> able to make it for my second master's, unfortunately. Uh, but I'm doing a lot of other cool stuff at the same time, so it's okay. Everyone thinks I'm, I think they get excited when they think I'm the Mona. And they realize that you're the Mona. So I was like, no, you're talking about, <laughs> this has been a long, a long Saudi minute. I've been the other Mona. So it's finally, we're finally here together. I want to get right into uh, putting you in context of the GCC for our viewers. It's an area, Saudi, we're hot off of FII. And there's a renewed interest and a vigor that's coming out of the kingdom. But that's an ecosystem that you are no stranger to. Uh, Help walk us through this. What are we looking at today? Basically, the region is exploding in potential in economic opportunity, partially due to the misfortunes of other countries, of course. I mean, it is it is quite a shame what is happening around the world right now. However, that means that when opportunity strikes, we were ready to take it over. The past five years in the kingdom, there has been a huge shift in youth potential, in expanding uh, horizons, expanding sectors, uh, putting a lot of effort into both um, human development infrastructure as well as real infrastructure. And so there's a lot of work that has been happening in the past few years. This year, when the whole world seems to be going heading into a recession, we're booming. Um, so yeah, uh, Saudi Arabia is the place to be right now, I think. You were one of the very early uh, advocates, I think, or, or voices and figures that we saw in the global scene in the tech industry. When we started noticing Saudi Arabia, of course, there was you know, the very famous participation of, um, of His Highness Prince Walid in Twitter, something that we hear about today. And you were there for the very beginning of that. Can you take us through that and tell us what you see from where you started to where you are? So it's very interesting. Um, I was in the U.S. actually when somebody uh, a friend of mine, and I was at the Carlisle Hotel, and uh, he was like, um, I have things about Twitter that I think people in Saudi Arabia should know about, especially Prince Saudi Arabia Talal, and I was like, um, sure, I'll I work for him, I'll, I'll tell him, and I hooked them up at the time, but I didn't really realize <laughs> what I was actually setting up in motion. I was in the philanthropy section, uh, section, so I was not ever involved in any of his actual deals. Uh, it just you know, took a life of its own. And it's very interesting. I mean, I love Twitter. I love Twitter. So I'm um, glad to have been a part of that. Would you pay $8? If you didn't have a check, would you have paid the $8, Yamona? If I didn't have it, I would buy it, right? I do have it. So right now, would I actually pay 
only if there are other services that are involved. I mean, right now, Twitter is going through a transformation and transformations are always messy. Things will take time to sort out. Uh, monetizing, there's so many ways of monetizing it. I would pay for, for example, a mapping of trolls. Like if there's any trolls that are coming at you, you could ask Twitter, you know, you'll pay $25 and they will send you the map saying, where did it start? How is it connected? All these kind of things. Mm -hmm. If you think you're being harassed, uh, for them to actually have a person to go through whatever you think is, you know, your harassment is, uh, so that there's a little bit of a personal touch with cultural context. I would pay for that. I would pay for the news um, to actually have more credible news um, items come, you know, uh, to have that community notes. I love that idea. So there's a lot of things I would pay for. But the check, if if everyone has it. What does it mean? You know, and in terms of that community notes, that's that's very on brand for you, Mona. That's sort of that's sort of your core. Yes. I think your core identity. You're very identified with being an advocate for community and an advocate for women, and that's something that has been a hallmark of your tenure and your career. Where did you start that? I don't know. <laughs> I think partially from you know I've, I've traveled all over the world, and this idea of belonging and making a connection strong and doing your best to help wherever you're at. I think that is something that I kind of brought in from my um, nomad type of life um, until I was in my early 20s. This idea of information, sharing it, ensuring that the right people have it, that it is credible, that it is useful, is something that is part of my brand, right? This is the reason I had the show, which, by the way, I left in 2018. Oh, I know. Um, I was going to say, I know I said that. I was like, she was, she is the, mo she's still called the Mopra, which we'll talk still about. Thinks, yeah, <laughs> everybody still thinks I'm still there. I'm like, no, I'm not. Uh, 2018, I left and they just restarted it again. So I think uh, about a month ago, four new women started the show and I really wish them a lot of, you know, good luck. Um, when we started it, there was no internet really, right? There was, I think there was only uh, Google. At that time, to, to enable families all over the Arab world, from Morocco all the way to, you know, Pakistan almost, to have the right type of information for their families, for themselves, to understand what kind of opportunities they could have, what other people are doing, and all in a very respectful manner. We were never sensationalist. I think that's I think that's one of the most important things about us. We never brought in a case that had issues to kind of create sensationalism. It was always about this case probably is representative of millions of people. How can we help that person understand what are the resources they can get, how they can use it, and how to actually talk to their families about the issues that they're having, whether it is, you know, there's family dynamics, whether it's, I, I mean, I remember one of the stories that was very interesting. 15 years ago, having a conversation, a very serious conversation with your parents about what kind of major you will study as a woman was a huge deal. Mm -hmm. Today, I mean, and this wasn't just in Saudi Arabia. This was across the board in the Middle East almost, where you were expected to either work at a bank, in a hospital, or as a teacher, that was it. Of course, there's so many opportunities even then that people didn't take advantage of that they were afraid of. We got so many emails of parents that were just so upset with us because we were teaching their children how to speak to them in a logical manner about their passion, about their future, and basically about, you know, what their life will be like. The idea that you would know how to approach the community, you know, you said that you you didn't do it in a sensationalist manner. That seems to me to be very Saudi. That's a very, in a very Arab way to approach, you know, something that might be difficult uh, or sensitive with, with, with discretion, with respect. In my time in Saudi Arabia, it was the very first time that we heard very honest and forthright public discussions about breast cancer, for example, saying yes. the naming the disease, you know, was in the, in the middle 2015, you know, the 2010s. And that idea that you can approach something sensitively, but truthfully, sort of one of the things that you and the Saudi women and the Arab women that I know become more public seem to personify. And for you, they call you the Oprah of the Middle East. I mean, there's the Oprah of China, there's the Oprah of Japan. So I do understand. I mean, Oprah really is a phenomena. So to be compared to her is amazing. Uh, but I also understand the ways that she is different from all of us. And the reason there's really only one Oprah. 
just again with Kalem Nawaim and with your background and the, the idea of the Arab woman entrepreneur, that's one of the things that yeah. I think of with you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One of our most popular shows actually was, um, I think probably 2016, and I still remember we did it in Dubai, um, and we had uh, six segments, all of them showcasing uh, Saudi female entrepreneurs. Now, entrepreneurship uh, is just another word for people who take risks while they're doing businesses, right? This is part of it. Um, that's the way that we look at it in the Middle East. So it's about a little bit of risk, but people who are going into, and we call it Riyadat al-A'mal, as you know. So it is about being a kind of pioneer and trying to push the envelope, but perhaps not in the same way as perhaps tech entrepreneurs are perceived in, 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 in the West. That show broke records because, first of all, people didn't realize how much Saudi women were like interested in business. And the type of businesses that they were showcasing were quite different even from the norm from us. So you used to, you know, open your own shop, you open a little bit of a cupcake place, you open up maybe a small business that is delivering some kind of uh, small service. But the ideas that were coming at that time, although they were typical from the rest of the world, uh, in the Middle East, it wasn't, they, they weren't used to seeing women doing these kind of businesses. And so that was like probably the number one uh, show in all of the 17 years that we've had. Wow. Um, what has happened recently that is extremely interesting is that the government, and I think probably all governments all over the world, understand now the power of technology. And so there's been a big push to get women into tech majors, computer science majors, coders. So there's all these kind of organizations that are you know, giving courses, helping these women um, become entrepreneurs, uh, bringing different types of expertise together, accelerators, a lot of funding going uh, towards uh, female tech entrepreneurs. So I think we have 30% of all entre- tech entrepreneurs are female entrepreneurs in Saudi Arabia. And they're getting a lot of funding. It's not 2.4 like the rest of the world. Ah, I was just going to mention the statistic of the rest of the world. Solely led female founders receive 2.4% of venture capital. And we are about three to four out of 10 in the Arab world led by, you know, our friends in the GCC. So what do you think is going to be the impact of this? How do we support that or foster that? So I do think one of the the things that I would be interested in seeing is more exchange programs and mentorship with major tech companies and tech pioneers out of the East and the West, by the way. We're not just talking about the West anymore. First of all, we have a very young population. So the younger the population, the more likely that the technology is just part of their life. So the mentorship, I think, is the place where we actually need a little bit more help to go to the next step. One of the things that we found at SGC very quickly was that there was a language barrier. While we all speak English and you know many of us speak other third and fourth languages, spe- reaching people natively into Arabic like this will be translated into Arabic in 16 other languages was an obstacle. Uh, And there are DAOs being created through the Arab world to help support the translation and support of blockchain education into Arabic. And I know that this has been one of your, you will die on the Arabic hill, Mona. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I will die. I will die. So first of all, there's anybody uh, who's listening who wants huge machine enabled fast translation of anything that is scientific-based, um, tech-based, please contact me. We have that. We have Adri. I'm a co-founder of uh, this amazing startup um, because my co-founder, Ali, actually has the tech uh, part of it, and I have the ID part of it. So in 2007, I started realizing that if we ever want to actually be competitive with the rest of the world. We have to graduate people from college who are able to understand and be up to date in every single field that they're graduating from, which was not the case simply because the majority of Arabs will study in Arabic. Journals are not being translated in Arabic. Majority of books are not being translated in Arabic, but most specifically is this academic knowledge in journals. Why? Because journals are basically the germ ideas that people are thinking about and studying and they put it in and then somebody builds on it. And so there's a lot more um, 
current knowledge. There's a lot more exploration than somebody who already wrote the journal article and then other people have commented on it. Then he, he writes the book and it's already, you know, jump the shark. My obsession since 2007 has been how do you translate academic knowledge as it is being created and enabled in a very cheap way? We tried through manual translation, didn't work. And then, of course, Ali had the same idea, and he was doing it with computer machine learning, and we joined forces. And um, I'm very happy to say that we have an office in New Zealand, in Bahrain, and in Saudi Arabia. And we hope that we will be in everywhere around the Arab world, but, you know. So, Mona, where are you right now? Well, it's interesting that you should ask. So, I've always been interested in poverty alleviation, and I've been doing different things for it. All my life, right? I was heading um, social development programs. I've consulted for many countries, um, helping to figure out economic growth. And so I've been working on it from a philanthropic and development lens for a very long time. And we'll always need philanthropy. We'll always need money to be placed with those who are most vulnerable, those who are facing, you know, conflicts and mitigating circumstances and diseases and all these types of things. But one way to solve it is through bringing in huge economic growth. And one way to do that is through technology. So right now, I'm doing Transform VC, which is a VC that is looking at a mission larger than itself. We want allies, we want partners. We want to create 1,000 thoughtful billionaires who are in tech, deep tech, who will come back to the rest of the world the, you know, the South, the Middle East, uh, and basically say, let me help you grow. Let me give back to the communities that we came from. And through deep tech, enable governments if needed, or economic activities, or bringing in mentorship to the young people. This is what I'm really focused on. Mass change through philanthropy, but through technology. This is an initiative that speaks to my heart and to our industry. We have a very young and mobile group of very digitally um, savvy, very deeply technological um, infrastructure being built. And also, even in the current market, it's, it's lucrative. Everybody's talking about what the crypto industry sort of looks like. And we seem to be, by and large, as we build our industry, deeply principled. What is the easiest way for my industry or someone from our world to participate in this initiative of yours? I'd love for them to contact me. I'd love to give you guys, um, whoever wants to come in and think about whether they are a thoughtful, uh, you know, deep tech person or somebody who wants to support that kind of mission to come in and we'll, you know, we'll talk and we'll discuss it. But if you want to do it on your own, that's also fine. But the point is, How can you actually use the gifts that you were given, the infrastructure that you're building that you or you made money off of and actually ensure that there is, as you said, inclusivity around the world? When I very first met Mona and every single time, everybody knows that she'll correct your Arabic grammar. She takes she will literally die on that hill and it's good for all of us. Um, Uh, Yes, Arabic is such a beautiful language and it's a shame that. Uh, we're losing touch with it just because English has dominated. I understand. I mean, I love English as well, but I, th- I do think that there's pride to actually be able to study in your language uh, first and then, uh, you know, English second. I want to stay here a little bit because this is some, this is tied to a lot of your thoughts and writings over the years about what Arab identity is. Where do you think we're going in this digital age? Are we, what's the real take? Where do you see this now and, and moving forward? So if you had asked me a couple of years ago, five, six years ago, I would have said definitely globalization was the way that we're all, you know, heading. There was benefits and, you know, disadvantages to it. And people mostly were pushing towards that world order. Um, Now we all know we're going through another world order. There's a transformation, another huge transformation that is like a tsunami happening um, all over uh, the West you're seeing the East rise. So politically, I do think there's going to be a deglobalization effort. 
and there's going to be regional and, and we're seeing this also as a result of COVID, right? Uh, almost every country and every um, company is looking at localizing their supply chain, um, going back to regions versus you know global. And so we're seeing all of this. Then there's the U.S. China situation that is <laughs> happening, and um, the U.S. trying as much as possible to retain its dominance. I don't think China is going <laughs> to. <laughs> it's going to take that, you know, maybe a couple of years, maybe five, maybe 10. But uh, we've known this since, you know, probably the 2000s that China will rise and it will take over and the world will look very different when it is the dominant uh, productive uh, country in the world. And when it has when it holds the debt for so many countries, there's going to be a lot of changes happening. I'm glad that we are in a good relationship with China. Yeah, I think about that in the region a lot that, you know, once you remove yourself being bicultural, just, you know, as you were saying, it's really different when I go back to Egypt. And it's really different when I see things in the context of Africa and I see things in context of the Middle East, as opposed to the context of California, right? It's yeah. it's just a kind of different lens. I'm doing a lot of research about the changes, the dynamics and workforce between Generation Z and Generation X and the boomers and all these kind of things. And you're seeing it play out in some of the banks like JP Morgan and all that stuff. But one statistic that I saw that was just like extremely shocking. So Americans are known to be more productive than anybody else, right? There's more, the GDP of the US just outweighs everybody until now due to you know, American um, uh, personality, ingenuity, personality, ingenuity, biggest market, the all ecosystem, this stuff. capitalism, yeah. all these kind of things. But working hours last year for Americans was an average of 34.6 hours. And so that was like a big wake up call. I'm like, OK, so maybe the whole Gen Z thing or, or Gen Y thing that is happening um, and the change of work ethics is going to catch up and affect the productivity of the U.S. Not right now. We're still doing very well in the U.S. You know, maybe five, six years from now. It's, you know, it's interesting. We see a lot of rhetoric coming out of um, a lot of the, well, out of Southeast Asia, out of Asia proper. Um, China and Japan have very concerted social media movements about the lay down culture or about what it means to, you know, be a productive, thriving member of society. So it's interesting to see how it's going to play out in the different parts of the world. What, what about our region? On one hand, we're, we're told that we are the fattest, most insulin dependent, uh, you know, most privileged generation of our ancestors who could live and survive in the deserts with like egal and some prayers. And then on the <laughs> other dates. hand- And some dates. And some dates, some hineni to get us through maybe the winters and some dates through the summers. And then on the other hand, we're told we're on the cusp of the second Renaissance in Nahda Tanya. Where do you think we are? So I think we have both. I really do. I mean, I, I can't speak for the whole Arab world on this. I'll be talking about Saudi Arabia. The ability to straddle both worlds exists. Uh, you see it in the young people who have a lot of pride in our desert heritage and being, and, and you still, like all my cousins, they still go to the desert every weekend, right? They go to the desert, they stay in the desert, they camp in the desert. There is this kind of like, uh, need to be in touch with that uh, part of our world. At the same time, technologically, we use social media, we use technology more than anybody else. To my 84-year-old mom, she knows how to use the iPhone and she knows how to do all these kind of things. And so, and we actually laugh sometimes when you see these stories about grandkids trying to help their grandparents do stuff. My mom, you just show her once. Because she has to know all these things. Otherwise, she will not be able to connect with all her grandchildren. She is like, of course, she gets a lot of misinformation as well on WhatsApp. <laughs> if you come to Saudi Arabia and you look at how do you um, book your appointments, how do you keep your medical records, how do you actually get all your uh, vehicle registration, driver license, all these things. I mean, I've done it in Malaysia. I've done it in, in the U.S. I'm doing it in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is by far technologically more advanced. I've heard China as well. Mona, you make me so proud of our region, of the women in our region and the stories and the voices that are shared around the world. You're one of the, the strongest personalities that have been out there for, for a while. If there were one thing that is 
something that you wish people knew about Saudi Arabia or about our region? And you've been doing this a long time. I, I know you're probably tired of being seen as the voice, uh, the Mopra. There's too many voices. I used to be the voice because nobody else would come on TV. We were extremely private. Social media changed all of that, actually. What do you want people to know about Saudi today? I really would like people to come and see for themselves. I think that there are certain misconceptions about Saudi Arabia due to the type of you know, entertainment and movies and the way that Arabs are being portrayed due to the interests of certain people to ensure that anybody with uh, rising power around the world is, you know, dehumanized. Um, but Saudi Arabia has changed and it's an amazing place to be at. Um, it has a lot of history, a lot of heritage, a lot of different ways of looking at things. And, you know, it's the quiet strength of Saudi can't be appreciated until you actually come and meet the people. They're so hospitable. I mean, seriously, I was with a friend of mine uh, yesterday and she was just telling me that you meet somebody for the very first time at, you know, a coffee shop and they'll be like, you know, come over to my house. You have to meet my mom and my kids and, and you have to come and have coffee and, and a few dates with us or have a meal. People love uh, the rest of the world and we, we are waiting for you to come over and visit. Mona, I can't wait for the world to come visit you in Saudi. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for inviting me. Our time is up for now, but the conversation is still going. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at Sino Global Cap, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and leave us your feedback so we can loop it into upcoming episodes.